Thank you so much, Raphael, and thank you so much, everybody, for um, the very warm welcome that I've had so far. This is my first time in Helsinki, and I'm very embarrassed and slightly ashamed that I don't know any Finnish, but I'm going to correct that by the end of the day. Um, I'm particularly happy to come to an event which is um, grounded in interdisciplinarity and intersectoral collaboration. I think in the 25 years or so that I've worked on this, I've become more and more convinced that we cannot affect any change in children's rights, in any aspect of children's rights, but certainly in child migration, without this uh, interdisciplinary and intersectoral approach of openness. So it's wonderful to hear about the work that the ENM have been doing with the uh, immigration authorities here. So in line with the theme of this conference, I'm going to offer some reflections on the best interest principle and best interest in practice based on a number of projects that I've been involved in, particularly in recent years. And I'm going to maybe think about how we can make this principle work harder in practice, um, both procedurally and substantively. So uh, just as a bit of a background, I'm going to just give you um, some background on the kind of legal framework around best interests. And I'm sorry if this is um, obvious to some of you here, but for those who aren't familiar with the legal framework, best interests is the main normative axis around which all decisions relating to children revolve, not just in migration, but across all areas of child law. And Article 3 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is the kind of most commonly cited um, foundation for this principle. But best interest finds its expression in all sorts of other previous international texts. We're about to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 1924 Geneva Declaration on the Rights of the Child, which doesn't mention best interests specifically, but it kind of germinates that idea that welfare of the child is the most important starting point. But we have things like the 1959 Declaration on the Rights of the Child, the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and children and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So, despite the fact that best interests is universally acknowledged as the central tenet of children's rights, its precise definition is still elusive and its application is highly inconsistent and contingent upon um, subjective determination. So has, as, as one scholar from nearly 50 years ago noted, she says, uh, he said, Robert Mnookin, that the enormity of this task of assessing best interests poses a question no less ultimate than the purpose and values of life itself. So the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child acknowledging that best interest is really central, has produced very significant guidance in its general comment number 14. It's probably one of the most helpful general comments, I think, and it defines best interest as a substantive right. It's, it needs to be a primary consideration informing all decisions concerning the child. It's a fundamental legal interpretative principle. It needs to be used to interpret all other substantive rights of the child, and it's a rule of procedure. So there needs to be procedural guarantees to enable children's best interest to be interpreted properly. So added to this, it's accepted that best interest does not operate in isolation from all of the other children's rights that exist. It's intimately linked with and instrumental to our interpretation of every aspect of children's rights. So we've got extensive guidance, including in a migration context on how to do this, including in the most recently revised UN High Commissioner for Refugees um, guidance on assessing and determining best interests. 
If you look at that, that's a very helpful document, I think, if you want to understand the background to best interests and the different ways in which best interests should be taken into account at different stages of the asylum procedure, then that's a very useful starting point. But um, I, think, I think if, if we look at the, sort of the best of best interests, what does best interests actually achieve? Um, in sort of principle, it has made children's rights and interests very visible. In a world that is run by adults, in processes that are largely do dominated by adultist agendas, it's kind of rendered children's rights very visible, very difficult to ignore. It helps us to navigate these clashes between competing interests, including the interests of the state, um, the interests of other adults, including vulnerable adults, and indeed the interests of other children. It helps us to also advan advance the interests of society. And I think this is where that clash between the state interests in controlling borders and children's rights is undermined. It's not a clash. We know that if we advance children's rights, it's good for society. It's a, it's a public interest function. It's in the public interest to protect children. As Nelson Mandela famously said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. And so we need to stop looking at children's interests as being in competition with the interests of the state. And also, best interest is very malleable. It can be adapted to a whole range of different contexts, children of all ages, all backgrounds, in all places. It can apply to the collective as well as the individual interests of children. So that's the good stuff about best interests. It's all great. It's great on paper. It's a light motif running through all of the EU asylum key. I spent about 15 years, 20 years of my career looking at best interests in an EU context. And it was probably the most kind of positively, extensively expressed element of children's rights um, in, in the EU framework. So the EU has done great work to really embed that in EU legislation. Okay, so what about the weaknesses? Well, one of the key strengths of best interests, which is, is adaptability to different contexts, is also its greatest weakness. It's massively indeterminate. And that, and that means that because it's indeterminate, it's susceptible to enormous manipulation to serve adultist agendas and to, to sanction and val validate untested assumptions about what is good for children. Now, Robert Mnookin, nearly 50 years ago, raised serious questions about the wisdom of deploying such a speculative, highly subjective, and acutely unpredictable framework to inform often life-changing decisions. And it's also been questioned whether it's even possible, let alone desirable, to achieve determinacy and predictability in decision-making particularly when it comes to lives that are characterized by constant fluctuations in living conditions, family constellations, and physical and mental health. How is it possible to determine best interests? Why should we pretend that best interest is easy to determine? Um, I think the holy grail of determining what is in best children's best interests is all the more elusive when we take into account that we just don't have consensus in a lot of case of, about what is good for children. We don't have the same kind of shared values to do with com com um, individuality, personal commitment, identity. In European democracies, we have increasingly less defined conventions and a less, less of a sense of shared values in some contexts. But we do have shared values when it comes to children's inherent vulnerabilities. And I think Sana's going to talk about some of that in her response. So 
best interest is still subject to highly subjective, adult-driven determinations of what actually childhood means, of what children are capable of, of what makes children vulnerable. Um, perhaps a more contentious criticism of best interests is um, the fact that it is confined to children. <laughs> and I, I, I think that might seem like a strange thing for a children's rights researcher and advocate to say, but I've become more and more convinced in the work that I've been doing that the best interest principle has been used more and more to validate exclusion from support rather than inclusion in support. And one of the key things, certainly in the UK, um, that our um, system has been doing is to simply not recognise children as children by age assessing them with more and more frequency, undermining their claims that they are children, and by delaying things for so long that they age out of any protections that are available. And that's where best interest becomes a mechanism of exclusion. So, how do we better best interests? Well, I'm going to talk about three pathways, I think, to improving best interests. And I'm going to suggest something that goes beyond all of that great guidance on paper and really starts to think about some fundamental um, procedural and substantive ways of looking at children's best interests. I'm going to draw on research, strategic litigation, and some campaigning that we've been doing. And a lot of that has been in direct collaboration with our home office, which is the equivalent of what you have here today. So I'm going to talk first of all about enhancing best interest literacy. And I don't mean the best interest literacy of children. I mean the best interest literacy of the decision makers and practitioners. So that's the first thing, how do we do that? The second thing is about future-proofing best interests. How do we retain the protections that are available under a best interest framework when that child transitions into adulthood? And I really find useful the, uh, the ENM work on that. And the third, is to think about a trauma-informed approach to best interest that goes beyond some of these kind of substantive issues and thinks about the core values, care, compassion that underpins these processes. Some of that we cannot legislate for. That's about our culture of working. So, talking about best interest literacy, perhaps the key to understanding what is best for children is um, to engage with children. And I know there's been some late, later ENM work on children's participation in decision-making. You can't do best interest assessment without good participation. And you can't do good participation in children, unless children know what they're participating in, why they're participating in it. So child-centered information is a key first step for any good best interest process. Now, there has been loads and loads of efforts to develop in more, more recent years child-centered information. The EU's latest strategy on the rights of the child has got loads of child-friendly versions of it now. Uh, when I first started in this field, there wasn't even any laws or policies on children. Now they've got child-focused information. Um, what I would say, though, is that um, a lot of that information, I think, is effectively a rebranding exercise of information that is really quite flawed in some ways. It's flawed in so far as it hasn't been developed in consultation with children. Children have had no stake in contributing to the development of that knowledge and wisdom that underpins law and guidance. And I was really struck by what was said there about plans, to, there's 15 legislative plans that are in place to develop new laws relating to, to migration and children. Um, and I guess my question would be, how much are children involved in that process? You know, what's the process for that? 
Now we were, we have, as you know, and I, I feel quite proud that I've got sort of 15 or 10 minutes into my talk and not mentioned the B word, but I'm going to just mention Brexit. Um, and uh, and sort of mop my bry and sort of take an antidepressant. But um, so we were commissioned by the Home Office to develop child-centered information relating to the new immigration scheme that was introduced post-Brexit to replace free movement. And uh, it's called the EU Settlement Scheme. And the EU Settlement Scheme uh, brought the previous free movement regime to an end and it was launched in 2017 to enable all European nationals who were living in the UK to retain their family residence and associated rights in the UK. And it was estimated at the time that over 3 million EU nationals were living in the UK under the free movement framework and they would have to register to remain in the UK before the 30th of June 2021. And it, early estimates suggested that there were about 900,000 children resident in the UK under that scheme. Now, as um, a member of the European Children's Rights Unit who'd done all of the work on children's rights in the EU, we had significant concerns about this scheme. Now, our concerns were, this is a brand new immigration scheme that contained absolutely no information about children's rights under the scheme. Um, all of the information about the process of registration for EU settlement made no mention to children. We didn't know whether children had to register separately. Uh, there was an implication that parents, if they registered, their children would be covered. There were also concerns that we expressed, along with lots of other campaigners that we were working with, that many children wouldn't even have a clue that they were eligible to apply. Many of those children were in the care of the state. Some of those children were, were in the criminal justice system. There were all, all of those really vulnerable children who were outside of education, where there was no platform to talk about the registration scheme. Children living in marginalized communities like the Roma community. Uh, children with special educational needs and disabilities, how were they going to be registered for the scheme if their parents didn't do it for them? There was no national, there's no nationality data collected in the criminal justice system for, or for children in the care system. So there was no way of even identifying whether some of those children had to register. And there were tens of thousands of these children that we felt would fall through the gaps in registration. And if they fall through, fell through the gaps with registration, they would eventually then become undocumented. And when they became adults and tried to apply for a job or apply for benefits, or even got into trouble with the police, they would be liable to removal or deportation. Now, we expressed all of those concerns to the Home Office at the time, and they were certainly borne out in the data. So by, the, um, by March 2020, um, there were 412,000 under 18s. That's less than about... 50% of the projected children in, in the UK who had to register that had actually rest, registered. So this was just a year before the deadline. Half of the children who was, should have registered had not registered. So about 500,000 children were still going to be undocumented in the UK. So we redoubled our campaigning efforts. And then the Home Office then commissioned um, us to develop child-focused information. They said, well, we need to try and get information about the registration scheme out to children, and parents need to understand the impacts of not registering their children. Um, local authorities who have children in care need to understand the prison, the prison population needs to be made aware as well. So we developed our child-centered information campaign for the Home Office. But we didn't do it just as a, here's the information, let's write it in child-focused language. We used it as an opportunity to consult with children who were directly affected by the scheme to understand how it was affecting them and whether the information and process was going to be fit for purpose. So we had this very unique opportunity um, to develop 
the knowledge and the information that could then feed into in a much more dialogic way. So sending that information back to the authorities and saying, this is not working, this is not fit for purpose, this needs to be amended. So we, we, we consulted with um, about 50 children across the UK in depth through a series of workshops on what this scheme would look like. We sent recommendations back then to the Home Office to say, you need to extend the deadline for children who are not going to be able to register on time. You need to make sure that there are concessions for children who have been in the prison system so that their criminal convictions are not held against them. And we sent all of this information and the Home Office actually adapted its guidance, it adapted its registration conditions to meet the needs of children. That is proper, child-focused, a best interest approach to the development of the law that underpins these processes. So that's the, the first thing. The second thing then is dealing with children who are at the cusp of adulthood and this is actually the majority of unaccompanied asylum seeking children. So um, I want to draw on a, a particular project called the Lives on Hold Our Stories Told project which we've just finished in July. We, ha we worked with partners across the UK to really look at the impacts of COVID on young unaccompanied asylum seekers. So we started it in the, in the height of COVID and we finished it in the aftermath of COVID. So we looked at the impacts and legacies of COVID. And what was important about this project is that we trained up um, 13 peer researchers, unaccompanied asylum seeking children and young people to work with us as co-researchers. So it was moving beyond just talking to children about their experiences to actively engaging them as equal co-researchers in the process. Um, we interviewed uh, 69 unaccompanied asylum seekers with these young peer researchers and we interviewed children, young people from across 13 countries and we also interviewed 53 different practitioners and looked at the case summaries of, of other agencies that were working with Eritrean unaccompanied children. So at this point I'm going to pass the mic over to the young people who were involved in our project. It's worth saying that they, we've got a whole kind of documentary on the project, but it's worth saying that they produced the documentary, they analysed all of the scripts with us, all of the transcripts, they did all of the animation, and then we worked with a, a, a film company to produce this. <laughs> When I first saw the UK border, for a moment I felt relief. You're not a child. What is your proof? Who takes paper and IDs when they're running for their life from the Taliban? I was 14 when I left my home in Afghanistan. And it took two years to get here. The nights were... One night, I had to hold on between the wheels of a lorry. When I got to speak with a social worker, they told me that because of COVID-19, the age assessments were delayed. They didn't believe I was a child, so they put me in a room with this man who smoked and drank constantly. Time is elastic. Sometimes it can go so fast. Other times, it stops dead. Soon I will be 18, and the age assessment won't even matter. I have to keep telling myself, at least I'm here now. I would do anything to escape what is back home. During COVID, everyone was in isolation 24 seven. But for us, that wasn't new. I made it from Albania to the UK, but I had no right to work. And with COVID, I couldn't even go to school. I'd be stuck in a small empty room trying to contact my lawyer with no Wi-Fi. No updates, COVID's delayed everything. No face-to-face -face meetings, even for children. I had no one, no one to explain anything, no one to share my fear, my pain. The nightmare with COVID took all that I had left. 
My soul is tired of hoping and fighting to only be shattered into pieces all over again. I don't recognize myself. I'm trying to hold on today as I'm not sure about tomorrow. Yet, here I am, still holding on behind this door. Now they tell me COVID is a thing of the past, but we still hear time and time again about the backlog and the waiting lists. So we continue to wait. But now I'm not dealing with delay alone. This research is our voice. This research is all the voices which everyone says they want to hear, but no one wants to listen to. We interview social workers who didn't just line you up, look you up and down, and say, you're not a child. Social workers who took the time to listen, explain, and help. A foster carer who treated his foster son like his own. A lawyer who helped a young person until the last day. She used to say, you have big dreams and you'll make it. But those people are the exception. Most of us are still falling through the gaps. The gaps which charities are trying so hard to plug. But they can't do everything. And they were never meant to. And they can't do it without funding. At least now the change is coming from us. Our lives might be on hold, but we're still changing the system for, for all, all the, the other, other young, young people, people coming, coming up. up. So, I mean, there is some kind of messages of hope within that. Sorry, are the slides back up? Um, the question for us as children's rights researchers working on that project was how useful is best interest to all of those children? How useful is the legal obligation <coughs> to ensure that the best interest of unaccompanied asylum seekers are upheld in those decisions and processes when the asylum seeker is not recognised as a child or they have to wait so long that they fall out of those protections? So this was a real barrier, um, sorry, um, in our study. For example, in the UK, in the year ending uh, June 2021, 74% of the 3,000 unaccompanied asylum-seeking children that were in the UK fell into the 16 to 17-year-old age group. Um, age assessment is being used with increasing regularity in the UK. So by the end of 2021, two thirds or 66% of unaccompanied asylum seeking children were age disputed compared to 31% in 2020. So two thirds of children arriving in the UK are actually age disputed. We know as well from the ENM report that um, uh, there's a significant proportion of unaccompanied children across the UK who are in that 16 to 17, in fact, the majority age group. The majority of them then um, age out before any claims are resolved. Um, of the 27 young people who were able to provide us with a really coherent timeline for their asylum journey, um, only five, that's 18%, waited less than six months for an initial decision. The rest, 82%, waited more than six months and were already 18 before things um, progressed. Now, the pandemic has massively aggravated those delays and it continues to aggravate it. So the result of the, that is that 25% of children who arrive in the UK um, age out even before they even get an initial interview. So how, do, how does best interest work for them? So 
the, pro the problem is, is that vulnerabilities don't expire just because they reach 18. And the ENM's um, study on transitioning into adulthood has been very useful in this respect. Um, what we wanted to kind of make the case for was not only for avoiding undue delay as a key component of a best interest process, you have to try and expedite good decision making for children, but you need to carry over the protections that would have been available to those children into adulthood if they've aged out through no fault of their own. Now, the possibility of future proofing entitlement in this way is not new. You have it in our aftercare services in a number of states. I know that um, in the ENM report on transitioning into adulthood, there is a good third of different EU member states that have got good aftercare provision for children, which carries over support, but it's not comprehensive. The majority of EU member states allow children to fall off a cliff edge of support as soon as they reach 18. They might provide some housing and social care services, but they certainly don't continue to provide free legal advice and representation. They certainly don't provide additional kind of educational support as well. So there needs to be a comprehensive approach to future proofing. Um, we've seen this in other aspects of immigration law in the UK, where the courts have said we can't impose a bright line rule. Persecution does not respect birthdays. So a final thing that I just wanted to talk about then that is linked to this is the need for a trauma-informed approach to all best interest process. That kind of goes, belong, uh, goes beyond what we're doing with our guidance at the moment. Now, this, we know that there's kind of limited transparency around how best interest decisions are taken into account, who conducts best interest assessment, what factors do they actually take into account and for what purposes. But what I would say is that underpinning all of this should be an attention to the impacts of trauma on migrant children's ability to actually engage in these processes and a corresponding attempt to adopt a trauma-informed approach. Now, there's been um, an awful lot of work in a practice context in education, social work, even trauma-informed lawyering um, that has really tried to work through what trauma-informed in practice looks like. But what does a trauma-informed approach to best interest decision-making look like? How does it complement and enhance what we've already got in a best interest context? What does a trauma-informed approach to research look like that underpins the practice and underpins the policy and under, should underpin kind of procedural guidance? So if just to kind of take us back to what trauma-informed means, well, according to Randall and Haskell, it entails becoming more astutely aware of how traumatized people have had have their life trajectory shaped by their experience and its effects and developing policies and practices that reflect this understanding. Now, in a traditional kind of definition of trauma, it's a highly biomedical. It's about the kind of impacts on the person's physical, mental health. But increasingly, and certainly in our project, we see trauma as systemic. Our processes, the personnel engaged in our processes are just as traumatic for children and young people as the factors that drove them to seek asylum in the first place. Um, basic lack of compassion and care, kindness, had an enormous impact on our children and young people. I was with an asylum seeker um, three days ago who just got a decision on her asylum claim. It took her three years to get a decision. It took her two and a half years to have her first substantive interview. She got a decision the other day from the Home Office that was written. It was about four pages long, mostly cut and pasted, just a general sort of 
this is the way that you're going to be returned if you don't appeal. Um, it was a refusal. The language and tone of that refusal was so traumatic for her. And then she was told that she had to go and report to the Home Office the following Thursday and that she could be detained and deported. That it's, it, now, decisions are decisions. Children, young people, we have to learn to live with decisions that are not necessarily what we want. But the tone and framing of this, those decisions could be so much more trauma-informed. Um, so we've looked a lot at how our system is traumatising young people, how delays, excessive delays, are actually traumatising young people and they are compounding traumas that already existed. But important for a trauma-informed approach is understanding the impacts of culture and context on how young people are able to engage with these processes. So, for instance, we spoke to lots of Albanians and um, the Albanian uh, culture does not encourage people to express emotion and they certainly don't encourage people to express vulnerability and mental health and trauma. And so in any engagement with any officials and certainly in their engagement with us during the course of the research, they just didn't really talk about their vulnerabilities, you know. And asylum claims rest heavily on fears of persecution or death, right? And so if you're not engaged in the cultures that these young people are coming from, then you have no real understanding to contextualize their responses or their silence. Um, so what we did was we tried to kind of embrace this, that the turning point for our research was that one of the young peer researchers that we had um, recruited, trained, was working with, attempted suicide during our research project and ended up in hospital. And that was a massive turning point for us. It was hugely distressing for the whole team. It was devastating for this young person. And it made us think about how we are accommodating trauma within our research. And so we, we decided to talk to the young people, how do you define your own trauma? What is it that is trauma, how, how is it that we should be re responding to your trauma? What is it? And so they had different kind of definitions of trauma. Some of them talk, talked about specific experience and some of them talked about specific feelings and behaviours. Um, and so we kind of had a, a workshop. We went to, we went to Wales and uh, stayed in a youth hostel for a few days. And we, we spent that time doing some of this workshopping, but we spent that time cooking with them, dancing with them, getting to know them, building relationship and caring for them and giving them a sense of community and family and building trust. So this is um, our kind of working definition of trauma. It's a person's experience of an, of an event, series of events or set of circumstances that are physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. It can have adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, emotional, or spiritual well-being. The nature and extent of those effects are informed by cultural and structural factors. And it's that last sentence that we need to just completely, really kind of bear in mind. So the question, I guess, for the, the end of this talk then is how can we work together intersectorally to create a trauma-informed framework, not just for research and practice, but for law and policy as well. So the Home Office, we've been working with the Home Office to think about how their processes can be more trauma-informed, not just for the young people who are engaging, but for the staff, the caseworkers, those who are sort of um, dealing with these claims and having to, in many cases, reject them as well. I think just by way of conclusion, it's, it's very easy for us to be cynical, deeply cynical and pessimistic about the way that children are, see, are treated in these processes. But I think we need to be aware, and certainly it's come out in the opening and with the conversations that we had last night, uh, and certainly with our dealings with the Home Office, that 
these um, people that we categorize as the kind of monsters of the Home Office and the immigration authorities are actually filled with deeply compassionate, well-intentioned, experienced individuals who have been in the system for, some of them for decades, have seen lots of different governments come through and are trying their best to work within the parameters of their discretion to make principled decisions and improve process. And certainly, you know, we don't have these raft of initiatives at EU level and at domestic level for no reason. They are driven by the desire to do things better. I think I was struck by um, the overwhelming goodwill that's in this room, that's it, with all of the people that I've engaged with, the Home Office is not Suella Braverman, you know, the Home Office is all of those, those deeply committed civil servants who are trying to do their best. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do is touch, work through the, what we call the soft spots of these organisations and processes. Where is it that we can actually make some change for individuals without necessarily having to change the government or the laws of the day? Good law is good, Go government is fundamental, but if we're stuck with quite uh, inadequate laws, then how can we change processes with the people that have that shared humanity and shared commitment? Thank you. much Helen for your very moving and insightful and informative speech. I think this gave us all quite a lot of food for thoughts for the rest of the day. Uh, now I would like to invite you to stay here okay. uh, and I would like to welcome Dr. Sanna Mustasari from the University of Eastern Finland who is an expert on this topic in Finland and she will provide some comments on Helen's talk from the Finnish perspective. So please, Sanna. Thank you, Helen, for a wonderful keynote and for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you also to the organizers for the kind invitation to participate in this important uh, event and these discussions. As you noted in the beginning of your talk, understanding the best interests of the child from a legal positivist perspective is important. The fact that the best interests is a legal norm and applies as an interpretative principle, substantive right and the requirement for a certain standard of, of procedure. I believe that it merits a mention that we still have a lot of training to do in that part as well. But you also point out the critical perspectives to the best interest, the fact that the openness of the norm makes it adaptive to various environments and a tool for very different uses. You point out that the best interests assessment is unnervingly instinctive, I'm quoting you, and highly contingent on the subjective assessment and value framework of the decision maker, a point that I think we can all agree with. And I definitely share your concern that one essential problem with the best interest principle is, as you say, that it, be it becomes part of the structured structures it operates in. So it legitimizes uh, exclusion in exclusive structures, and it can, as you say, reinforce particular notions of childhood, and with that also of parenthood and care and normal or acceptable de dependence. Our Finnish colleagues, Milka Sormunen, Joa Hiitola and Sara Pellander, for example, have compared understandings and uses of the best interests concept by the courts in child protection cases on the one hand and immigration cases on the other. Milka Sormunen analyzed best interest argumentation in the two, case, uh, uh, two uh, groups of cases uh, in the European Court of Human Rights. And she found uh, that in child protection cases, the court assumes that it is in the child's best interest to live with their parents. Whereas in immigration cases, family unity is not the starting point of the assessment. 
In immigration cases, furthermore, the child's young age is understood as adaptability, whereas in child protection cases, young age is associated with care needs. The court also has considered children's views in several child protection cases, whereas it does so rarely in immigration cases. In my own work, I've argued that the best interest assessment in family reunification cases can construct the child, even if the child is an EU citizen, as non-belonging and alien by emphasizing connections to the parent's country of origin, rather than those facts that speak on behalf of uh, the child's belonging to the country where she or he lives in. And this is, of course, of relevance when evaluating whether family life can be led in some other country or, or whether the, the family should stay in the, in the country where they are. The critique on best interest principle is important because we need to be aware of the inherent limitations of the best interests as a concept and of logics and rationalities that seek to exceptionalize and isolate children and childhood from other areas of life, from other relations and society that not only surround the child, but also constitute the child. This, I believe, is something that resonates also with some important work done on concepts of vulnerability and autonomy. In her work, Martha Albertson Feynman suggests that we should reconceptualize vulnerability or legal subjectivity, not through autonomy, but vulnerability, which she understands to be the basic condition of all human life. In a similar way, Alison Dudek has spoken of laws fixation with autonomy and nearly fetished ways of perceiving, perceiving uh, vulnerability uh, in situations where rights and legal claims are grounded on extreme conditions of vulnerability. Although neither Feynman nor Dedek speak directly in the context of migration law in their discussions of vulnerability, I think that their insights into how we think about vulnerability bears relevance in migration context as well. It seems that the tendency in Finland, as in, as in other, other countries as well, is towards stricter immigration rules and vulnerability will be more and more used as the basis on which rights are granted. Rights in this thinking follow from exceptional vulnerability. If you're not exceptionally vulnerable, you're on your own. It is thus easy to see that vulnerability is not something that follows from solidarity, but something that excludes, isolates, and exceptionalizes. For Feynman, the good that law ought to serve is not mainly freedom as understood uh, as non-dependence, but something that constructs resi resilience and structures that create resilience. And as you talked about the three examples of how to better the best interest principle, I'm thinking that you're doing more than just bettering our legal argumentation. This is important too, to better the legal argumentation, but I think you're doing more than that. I'm thinking that you're developing here tools that make the best interest principle something that can contribute to resilience, even in harsh environments. Uh, such as immigration control, control at times. And you offered us three examples of how to better the best interests. And I think all of these are relevant to our local context as well. Although, of course, the examples come from a legal social context uh, where the numbers of applicants are far higher than here. And there's recently been a huge and somewhat unpredicted change, the B word you mentioned. So the first example you mentioned, although related to Brexit, is also relevant in this corner of the world. As the field of migration law is so prone to political controversies, the legislation seems to be in constant uh, change and turbulence, with amendments being made first in one direction and, and then when the government shifts to a completely opposite one. And this, of course, poses challenges to law drafters, and practitioners, uh, caseworkers, but of course, most of all, uh, to the individuals. And it's of vital importance to be able to communicate these changes in an accessible way to those concerned. 
However, you call for a vision on the right to information that would go beyond the right to receive accessible information. A right to information that would cover the right to participate in constructing that information. And I think that this is very, very, very uh, crucial. And I also think that this event too demonstrates a shift in how we understand the right to information and children's role in producing that information. I see a clear change here. The second example you mentioned is about the LOST project and extending the best interests beyond the strict chronological confines of legal childhood, the future proofing of, of the best interests uh, assessment. And I think the video we saw shows very well the artificial limit between childhood and adulthood, especially for the unaccompanied minors. The video also illustrates what it might mean that children and young people themselves are participating in the construction of the information and knowledge. And you raise an important point about how well the best interest principle serves this age group, 16 to 17 year olds, when they apply for asylum. And most of the uh, minors in this group in Finland too fall, fall in, um, uh, most of the uh, unaccompanied minors fall in this age group here too. Most of them are coming from Afghanistan and Somalia, so it might be difficult to, <coughs> to um, uh, examine their, their cases. And the aging out is an issue here too, even though the uh, court of EU Court of Justice uh, ruled in 2018 uh, um, that the uh, age when the uh, application is lodged is the fundamental one, uh, not the date when the decision is made. Um, current legislation requires that the reference person or sponsor who has received international protection in Finland was a minor on the date when they lodged the asylum application in order to be considered as a minor for the purposes of family reunification. But, but the problem still is that most of them receive residence permits on compassionate grounds and thus end up losing the possibility for family reunification when they turn 18. The right to be reunited with one's family is of fundamental importance to unaccompanied minors. And there are huge difficulties in this uh, process that cannot be addressed here fully. And it's a tricky thing to address in the future as well, because the changes that seem to be coming uh, don't promise very much um, flexibility in, in these assessments. However, some positive issues are worth mentioning too. Under the Integration Act, a person who has applied for asylum and received a residence permit is entitled to specific support and services until they reach the age, age of, of 25. Although, as you noted, representation ends when you turn 18. Now, the third example of bettering the best interest that you mentioned concerns adopting trauma-informed approach. And here too, I think we can all agree that if we are to better the best interests, and specifically if we understand it broadly as a measure for building and creating resilience in a world and life defined by vulnerability as a fundamental condition of human lives, uh, human life, we need to be able to deal and understand trauma much better than we have previously. And, and I also think that this is very much in line uh, with the general comment number six of the CRC. And some of our colleagues, for example, Suvianna Hakale and Katarina Sovela, have emphasized uh, this comment especially as it requires that the best interest is evaluated in a child-sensitive manner and by practitioners who are trained in, in doing this assessment. So, to sum up my comments, I think that you and others who work to better the best interests of the child have helped us move beyond the position of the unhappy crit who is able to point to problems but unable to find any solutions. And in this endeavor, we need to listen to the diversity of voices and to think together to produce better practices. And this event certainly is a step in that direction. So thank you, Helen, and thank you, organizers.
thank you so much, Sana, for your comments. And I know, do you have, Helen, have, do you have something to, that you want to pick up on, on Sana's comments? Then I think we have probably might have some questions in the room, maybe online. But please, if you have, if um, you want to. Maybe, maybe I'll just allow others to speak in a moment. But um, thank you, Sana. You expressed so much of that much more articulately than I did. So thank you for that very generous response. Um, I think what's really interesting is the work that's been done here. And we've started to look at some of this as not seeing best interests in these legal silos, best interests in immigration versus best interests in family decision making versus be that we need that best interest to see best interest as a universal concept that it is, that it doesn't just become less important because it's in an immigration context. So what can we learn from the processes surrounding family justice, uh, um, criminal justice as well. There's a much more child-centered approach in those contexts. So we, there's lots of really good practice across these disciplinary silos. Um, I, think, I think I was also struck by a conversation that I had with Miriam last night um, at Helsinki University about um, this pedagogy of hope. This, how do we create conditions of hope? One of the key things that struck me talking to all of our young asylum seekers is how hopeless they felt. So how do we create conditions of hope? And I think a theory of vulnerability is important, but theory of hope, I think, is something that we could start to focus our efforts on. Uh, and that's not blind optimism. I think there's something much more substantive that we could do there in terms of hope. 